Good, yay. Well, oh, you guys are awake today. Did you have a good day yesterday? Wasn't that awesome? I just like, ugh, I can't get over how good it feels to be around like-minded people. Um, I have to tell you a funny story. So I didn't bring my husband with me uh, this trip because we have just too much going on. You know, leaving a homestead in the summer is a whole thing, as many of you know. Uh, there's watering and milking. And so I was, I was on Facebook last night and I was scrolling and um, I have my, some family visiting while I'm gone. My, my husband's family is visiting. And I noticed that my sister-in-law was posting pictures of her and her daughter at my house, right? They were visiting. And she was feeding our bottle calf and they were walking through the garden and they were holding our pigs. We don't have pigs. <laughs> and so... I texted my husband and I'm like, why is Clara holding a pig in my front yard? And he's like, hi, how are you? How is your talk? <laughs> Turns out he impulse bought six piglets, six, six, uh, without any consultation with the board of directors. So um, I have six pigs at home. I'm not anti-pig, it just wasn't in the plans for this year. So the moral of the story is, if you're coming to an event like this, bring your spouse. Because you don't know what it will be like when you get home. But anyway, um, I'm not going to talk to you about pigs today. I actually get to talk to you about raising old-fashioned kids. Um, I love this topic. I'm also not an expert in this topic. I kind of even get a little nervous talking about it because there's nothing like animals or children to make you look like a liar, right? You're, you're standing up and you're telling how good you are with, what, with, with something or how much you have figured out, and then you turn around and they're eating the couch. Both applies to children and animals sometimes. And so I'm going to bring what I have learned in my limited time as a mother. I have a 13, 10, and 7-year-old. So I'm not an old pro, but there's some things I've observed and some things I've made mistakes around and things that I've found that work better for us. So I'm going to bring that to you today to the best of my ability. And even if you don't have children, I think there's some stuff in here that just applies to humans in general. So I'm excited for our time together today. So interestingly, as I was preparing this talk uh, for today, I happened to randomly get attacked by an internet mob around this topic. And it was not something I had intended, obviously. Um, but as many of you know, I create content online. It's one of those weird uh, juxtapositions of what I do. I milk cows, and I grow gardens, and I make bread, but I also talk about it online. And so um, I posted a reel on Instagram where I was explaining that our family did a TV fast uh, starting in December of last year. And so we are not anti-tech, obviously. I have computers. I, I make a living online. Um, we have phones. And we've had a Netflix subscription. We don't watch excessive amounts, but I just noticed over the winter that we were maybe watching a little more than I was comfortable with. Have you guys ever had that revelation? You're like, it's not necessarily bad, but what is it displacing? When we're watching you know, a movie a couple times a week at night, what, what could we be doing instead? And so my husband and I had that conversation, and we just started to analyze. And we said, let's just take a break. We're not going to just denounce TV as evil right off the bat, although it can be sometimes. But it isn't inherently evil, and so we said, let's just take a break. So we shut it off. Our kids were surprisingly cool with it. They, there was not as much wailing and gnashing of teeth as I had expected. And um, we, we committed to do it for three months. And it ended up turning into four months, and then five months, because none of us missed it. And we were still using screens. I'd still let them look up um, tutorials on YouTube, and they were looking up how to draw certain things. So it's not like it was a complete blackout. But man, when we weren't watching Netflix on some of those weeknights, we were reading more. We were creating more. My kids started to learn leather work. We got this $10 chess set that taught them how to play chess, and they just like taught themselves how to play chess. And I didn't have to do it. And they were just so engaged, and I loved what I saw. So I posted a 30-second clip of that on Instagram. Not a prescriptive thing. I'm just like, hey, we tried this, and here's what worked. Well, it made the internet very angry, very angry. And you know, who, who creates content here? Do I have any YouTubers or Instagrammers here? No? Yes, a few? OK. Those of us who create content, like our dream is like for something to go viral, right? We all want the video to go viral. Let me give you a little tip. You might not want your video to go viral, because what it does is it dredges up the bottom of the internet. Um, and so that's what happened. And so I had this very innocent, what I thought, little clip of my kids reading books and playing chess and playing out in the barnyard. And 
it created a lot of strong feelings for a lot of individuals. And so whenever I find myself in that situation, you know, it gives me lots of time to think um, about their response, my response, what created that tension for them. And I'm not going to show you any of those comments today because, quite frankly, they don't really deserve attention. Um, but there was one comment in particular that really got me thinking. And it really happened to segue well into this topic that we get to share today. Um, but the comment that caught me off guard the most was repeated people said, you are damaging your children by not allowing them to watch TV. You are damaging them. You are hurting them. And they said they will never be able to be prepared for the real world without television. OK, that's fascinating. OK, I'll sit with that for a minute. Um, and it led me down. I mean, I know a lot of this stuff, right? I know what my, my gut response, I know what my initial reaction is. But sometimes I just like to dig a little deeper. You guys follow me online. You know I like to go deep. So it led me to ask myself, how do we prepare our kids for the real world? What is the real world? Because there's a huge division in our culture right now. If you listen to Rory talk yesterday, he did a really good job of explaining that and kind of mapping that out, what it looks like um, on this side and that side. And there's an increasing number of people moving towards this idea that the only real world, the only way that we can be living to our full potential is with screens and technology and progress, progress, progress at all costs. And then there is this other side that's probably you and me. We fit into that other one a little bit better, right? We see the real world as being nature and grass and what you're doing on your homestead and connecting to our communities. And I guess what my lesson from this viral video was that there's more division there than I anticipated. There's more people entrenched in their beliefs than I anticipated. And it reminded me of this Wendell Berry quote, which I'm going to paraphrase. But he says that the biggest division moving forward, in essence, will be the men who wish to live as machines and the men who wish to live as men. And it made me think of this, right? There's so, push, so much of a push in our culture today that screens are the answer, the metaverse is the answer, AI is the answer. And I don't necessarily think all of that is wrong. But I think when we get off kilter, especially with our kids, right? These are, this is a generation that's going to be exposed to technology from the time. They're never going to know life without it. I'm 38. I've known life without it for a period. Many of you have known life without it. They have never known life without it. And so what is the real world to them? And how can we help them navigate what it looks like to move forward, but also keep the best of generations past? And so as I look at these two sides, and I have people yelling at me on the internet about how their side is the only way, and I have my own opinions about the, the other side, it made me kind of look at the data and statistics around these two choices. And so just so happened to have been working on a new book the last couple of years, and it gave me an opportunity to look at some pretty cool research. And some of these uh, pieces of data that I found, man, I just can't stop thinking about them. There was a study that was done that shows that the majority of children today, 85% of girls and 78% of boys, are not meeting the current recommendation of one hour of physical activity a day. They are not playing. Do you know what it takes to get children not to play? Children just play by default. They are, they are made to play. They are designed to play. They can't help but play. You look at baby animals. They play just by way of being, right? Play is how all animals and humans, we learn. We, we test the world around us. We develop our bodies. I was listening to a really interesting podcast interview the other day about how um, if you, you know how puppies mouth you all the time? They always are biting and it's really annoying because they're, they're sharp little teeth. And they said, if you never let the puppy mouth you or something, they never learn the boundaries. They're literally learning how to control their jaw and they're understanding what's appropriate strength by mouthing. But that's their play, even though we find it annoying. And so they, he was talking about how we can help guide the puppy through understanding and regulating itself by letting it experiment. But it reminded me of our kids. Like Our, our modern systems are set up to where our kids we're taking that play out of them. We're, giving, we're not giving them a chance to test their strength and, and bite and experiment. We're just taking that right out. Another study showed, kind of along these same lines, that kids spend less than seven minutes outside. You guys have seen these statistics before, more than likely. But four to seven hours on screens, right? And that's a big 
part of that not playing. That part that they need that explores and creates, they're, they're putting that energy into their screens instead of experiencing the world around them. But this was the one that got me the most. Anxiety and depression in children rose 29% from 2016 to 2020. That was pre-pandemic. I can only imagine what that is now, right? And, and this is the phrase that I just couldn't stop thinking about. And you can see it all over online, pediatric mental health crisis. And, and people use it so much, it's almost lost its meaning. Like, sit with that for a minute. Pediatric mental health crisis. Like, that's scary, y'all. That's scary. Like, what, what is happening? Something happened. Something changed. It's not that the olden days were always perfect and rainbows and sunshine, but something has shifted. And I can't help but ask, why? How did we get here? So in my course of research, digging in deep to this, you know, there's, there's never rarely a singular easy answer, right? There's a lot of different factors that converge into topics like this. Um, you have to accept the gray areas and the nuance and just the pieces of history that roll together to produce our unique situations. But basically, in essence, one of the biggest contributing factors to, the, to this is that childhood has changed over the, the decades, especially the last 150 to 200 years. There's this great book called Huck's Raft by Stephen Mintz, uh, and this quote really encapsulates it. He says, from the vantage point of history, contemporary children's lives are more regimented and constrained than ever before. Also, I would like to add, I think parents are more exhausted than ever before. Can I get an amen? You guys ever feel that or see that? Yeah. And I, th I think this is interesting on, on multiple regards. So first off, this historical arc of parenting has changed, right? Back in the olden days, Little House on the Prairie and before, kids had to be a part of the team because there was no other option. You know, we didn't have dishwashers and, and washing machines and grocery stores. So if a family was going to survive, the kids played a vital role. And of course, now as the Industrial Revolution rolled along, we get to the point where we are now in history. We don't need that as much. We have all this convenience and all these appliances and all these pieces of our modern industrial life that have made that easier than ever before. So not only do the, does the average family have more disposable income, they're having children later, uh, and they also just don't have as much to do, right? So that's not all a bad thing, right? I'm not saying that we should go send our children out to be chimney sweeps like the olden days, right? There's a balance here. But I'm, I'm also always asking myself, how can I bring the best of the past and weave it in with the new? And how is that going to affect my family and myself? And so it's not that the parents of yesteryear were so much smarter or so much better than us. It's just they were in a different environment that set them up for different outcomes. And so the question is, how can we duplicate the best pieces of that in our modern world? And I think my favorite part of this as a busy mom with lots to do is that this is a, a way that not only makes our kids healthier, but it gives you some freedom as parents to do a little less, right? Modern parenting is such a paradox because we're expected to do so much for our kids, yet the results that's happening on the other end isn't ideal. Like parents are, are, they have the best of intentions, right? None of this is done with bad intentions. We want the best for our kids. There's a huge push for kids to get into the best colleges. And I look at the parents in my circles at home and it's all the extracurriculars because they need this scholarship and they need to get this sports thing so they can go to this college or they can do this thing. They're trying to set their kids up for success. They're trying to do everything right. But not only is it making our kids sometimes a little bit out of whack, but it's also exhausting us. And so what I see old-fashioned parenting as being, this old-fashioned formula, is a way that we can strategically do less with better results and happier families in the end. And so with so much pressure on parents these days, I think this is a huge relief. So I'm excited to cover two pieces of this with you today. These are a part of what I call the old-fashioned fix, the old-fashioned formula. So if you were at my talk yesterday, we covered one and two. And I think they have that recorded somewhere in the Homestead Festival website. I think people who got a ticket get access to those videos. So if you want to watch that, you can go check it out. Um, today we're covering number nine, which is about families and kids. Also, side note, I had a lot of questions. 
I do have a booth here, but we kind of were deciding to play Where's Waldo with y'all. Anybody tried to find me yesterday? I am sorry. Um, I didn't bring a lot of paraphernalia for my booth because I came from Wyoming. And so I don't have great signage. Marketing fail 101. Bad signage. And I wasn't there a lot because we were moving around. So where the booth is, I'm going to be there after today's talk. Go back to the milk cow. Do y'all know where the milk cow is on that fence? Okay, find the milk cow. Mule Town Coffee is right next to the Milk Cow. I'm right across from Mule Town Coffee. And I have a few little poster boards, but they're not giant, so you're going to have to kind of look. But I'll be there, and I have book plates, and I can chat with you guys and take pictures over there. Um, but these are basically the essence of my next book, and we're gonna, we don't have time to talk about them all today, but we're going to talk about number nine. And so this first pillar of this old-fashioned fix, the old-fashioned formula in regards to parenting and children is curiosity. We're going to encourage curiosity. So about a year and a half ago, I lost my children. Have you guys ever had that feeling? For those of you who are parents, have you ever had that even for 30 seconds? There is no worse feeling in the entire world. Like I can't fully explain what your gut does, what your heart does. It's this feeling of dread. And even if it's just a few minutes, your brain just goes to the absolute worst case, right? Um, one time, the only, one and only time we've been to Disneyland, don't, we don't plan to go back. But anyway, I lost my child for three minutes. She was small and she followed another family down the path. Like I was, I'm pretty tough. I'm pretty resilient. I'm a problem solver. I was just a disaster. In the course of 30 seconds, I was done. And she, here she came toddling back, and it was fine. But anyway, a year and a half ago, I lost all three of them at once. Their bikes were in the driveway. We checked all of the normal places: the chicken coop, the barn, the pond. Or we have it's, it's a, okay. We call we have a puddle that we call a pond. I know you guys would laugh so hard at that. It's a puddle. But anyway, they, I checked the puddle. I checked the shop, I checked the rooms, and here's the scary part. The dogs didn't even know where they were. You know how the dogs always know where the kids are? The dogs didn't know. They were just looking at me like, I'm out of ideas. And so my panic started to rise. I called my husband, I called our hired man. I'm like, we got to find the kids. We're walking around yelling for them. Nothing, nothing. Finally, I get a call from our hired man. He says, I found them. Turns out they were in the stock trailer, our cattle trailer, in the back pasture. And what had happened is they, all three of them, had gotten inside and not realized that you can't open it from the interior. So, and it has holes, right? It's not airtight, so they, they would have been fine. But they were back there yelling for our hired man, and he heard them yelling. Um, so we, we talked, and then they weren't in trouble. I'm like, guys, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Don't put yourself in enclosed spaces that you can't open. You know, we had the whole, all, the, all the conversations. But this is the best part. The next day, they went back to the stock trailer with all sorts of things. They had ropes. They had pulleys. They had horseshoes. They had buckets. They had nails. And they, they left one of the siblings out of the trailer, and the other two went inside, and they decided to figure out that the, the one outside was like the, the safeguard, right? And the two inside were going to try to figure out how to get out with their tools. And so they spent the entire day locking themselves in the stock trailer. And they turned it into an escape room. And then they brought their friends over and locked them in the trailer and s to see if they could get out, right? And it was so adorable. But man, such a good example of curiosity in kids. It is a magic combination. And I have been reminded so many times over the course of my parenthood and just being alive that curiosity, whether we're talking children or adults, is the very best education. And as we work to bring this curiosity to the surface in our kids, it's also really good to think about how we learn as adults, right? So I would venture to guess that you are here today because you're curious about this homesteading lifestyle, right? Is anyone forced here today against their will? Husbands, don't raise your hands if that's you. It won't bode well for you tonight. Okay, right? Everyone mostly wants to be here because you're excited. You're an adult. You have choices. You can decide where you want to be, and you chose to be here today. Now, contrast that with if you have a job where you have to take, like, continuing education credits or get certifications. You know those classes where you just, like, do your time, you get the certificate, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Do you, where, where do you learn more? Today? or in the, in the continuing education certifications, right? 
when someone tells you to learn just because they think you should learn something, doesn't work quite as well for you. You're not getting it into your brain. You're not absorbing it and let it, letting it become a part of ourselves. And so it's the same with our children. And that's not to say that our children should ever only do things that they want to do. Because I have that conversation with my kids all the time that, you know, sometimes we have to do things that we don't want to do, adults and kids included. But I think as we're educating them, whether you're a homeschool parent or, or not, right? Because even if your kids go to traditional um, public school, you're still having a role in their education. So how can we encourage that curiosity and help them find those things that they're naturally drawn to? Because when we can plug into that with our kids, I have found in my family, everything has changed. I don't have to force them. I don't have to nag them. I don't have to beg them. I don't have to try to you know, do it for them. It just happens naturally. So I like to think of this, and I'm, when I'm thinking of how to cultivate this in my family and myself, I use what I call the shower principle. The shower principle. So what happens when we take a shower? Well, lots of things happen when we take a shower. But one of the things that happens to me, I and mean, you guys maybe will relate to this, I get my best ideas in the shower. Anyone else? Or mowing the lawn. Another really good place is picking the pins in the barn, weeding the garden. Right? But the shower is the best because there's nothing magic about the shower. It's the last frontier where corporations and technology have yet to encroach. Unless there is some strange shower app out there, which I hope there's not. And if there is, don't buy it. Right? But there's no screens in a shower. There's nothing to tap. There's nothing to watch. You're stuck in there with your thoughts. And what happens when we're stuck alone with our thoughts? Our brain processes. We think through things. And we get the good ideas. I cannot tell you how much of the content that you might see on my online platforms has come to me while I'm taking a shower. Like so many times I'll get out, my hair is wet, I'm dripping, and I'm like, where's the notebook? Where's the notebook? It's going to leave my brain. I got to write it down, right? Um, the book that I just wrote came to me in the shower. Podcast episodes come in the shower. Instagram posts come in the shower. The shower is magic because when we have that empty space, when we have in essence, boredom, in a sense, our brain starts to, to ruminate and it comes up with solutions and create creativity and ideas. So the answer of how do we cultivate that curiosity that is so magical in our children and ourselves, the very first step, let them be bored. And if you look around at modern childhood, and, the, and please know anything I say today is not a judgment on you because I'm still learning this. I still make mistakes. There's lots of different situations. This is my standard disclaimer. Lots of different families. You do what works for you. But what I see in the families that I know, and sometimes even I get off kilter a little bit, is that we're, we're so involved in helping our kids be successful in their lives. We want them to have all the extracurriculars and all the sports and to have a full schedule and the music lessons and the dance lessons that they're missing a chance to just be bored. We're missing a chance to just look out the window when we drive and think, think about the farm lot. I remember when I was a kid, like we didn't have any screens in the car, you know, because they didn't exist. And so it was looking out the window and counting how many cows, like for 500 miles, right? And that might seem quaint and outdated in our modern culture. We'll just plug a movie in for them. And there's nothing wrong with that sometimes. But when we always are plugging them into something, whether it's a screen or an activity, they miss that chance to be alone with their thoughts. And I, this is a book that I absolutely adore. I highly recommend it. Uh, anything Cal Newport writes is good. But this one especially, Digital Minimalism. Hey, has anyone read that? Star student right there in the front row. <laughs> she prepared. Um, I love this book. And it's, more, it's about more than just screens. He, he talks so much about just the bigger picture of what we're missing in our culture, but he has this term called solitude deprivation, which he defines as a state in which you spend zero time alone with your own thoughts and free from input from other minds. Now, I don't know about you, but I have been in plenty periods of my life where I am in a state of solitude deprivation, even on the Wyoming prairie on a homestead. Right? There have been many seasons of life where I am running or I'm overscheduled, or when I do have quiet time, I'm plugging myself into other people's thoughts and ideas. I love a good podcast. I produce a podcast. I hope you listen to my podcast, but I also hope that sometimes you don't listen to anything. I hope sometimes you go on a walk with your phone at the house and you just think. And I hope sometimes that you weed the garden in the silence and feel the soil between your fingers and commune with the earthworms and you don't have anyone, including me, talking in your ear. And there's that balance, right? It's not that one's always bad and one's always good, but I hope that you're able to find these times 
where you can have that silence and your own thoughts. Because if you're trying to solve a problem in your life, you're trying to start a business, you're trying to work on a relationship, oftentimes you have those solutions already here. You just can't hear them through all the noise of modern culture, right? So Cal Newport in this book, he talks a lot about some of the, the most famous people in history, some of the greatest minds. And he talked about how much they prioritized solitude. Abraham Lincoln was very purposeful with his walks, especially under his times of greatest stress. He was so intentional. He's like, I want to walk. No one talk to me. No one bother me. Nikolai Tesla was like that. Thomas Edison was like that. These men that came up with life or world changing ideas and inventions, it started with solitude and quiet. And so, so much so, I'm trying not to trip on this cord. If I do, you can laugh, it's fine. Um, so much of this also is crucial for our children. Our children are, are more capable, and I'm kind of stealing my next point a little bit, but they're more capable than we've been led to believe. They can do so much more than we think if we just get them a chance with those little brains to start engaging. So, the next logical question is how? Right, because I, I talk to a lot of parents, and our culture is not set up to promote this. So we're kind of left with this of this question of, well, where do I start? Especially when all the other families around me are doing things very differently. How do I start um, pushing back against that a little bit? So I have a few practical tips for you. The first one, are you ready for this? It's a little bit complicated. Do you have your notepads? Good. Okay. Try. It. I'll try to, to simplify it. Just do nothing, y'all. Like. Stop overachieving as parents. Just sit back and let them be, okay? And this is so hard. I am type A. Some of you are type A. We want the best for our kids, and so we're, we're, a little, we're a little bit in there too much. We're trying to orchestrate all the things. We're trying to micromanage. Sometimes all we have to do is just stop. Say, you know what? Maybe we won't do 16 lessons of all the things this summer. Maybe we'll just do 10, and you'll have a couple afternoons a week where you can just be a kid. You can play outside in the dirt, and I'm going to go do my things, and you get to go explore on your own, okay? Doing nothing is way underrated. It is so crucial. Uh, and it also gives you a lot of peace as a parent, I think. It gives me a lot more time. People say, how do you get things done with three kids? Well, they asked me that more when they were little. And I'm like, well, I play with them and I teach them and I homeschool them. But then there are times in the afternoon where I'm like, listen, y'all, you go be kids and I'm going to go do my adult things. And no one died. They were fine. <laughs> right? Even as little babies, I'd be like, you know, two-year-olds, 18 months old, I'd put a little blanket on the floor with toys, and I'd be like, you can stay here. I'm going to be in the kitchen. You're not abandoned, and you know you're not abandoned, but mom's going to cook supper, and you're going to be here, and we will both be good. And that teaches that healthy um, self-sufficiency, in essence, and it's so good for them. It's so good for them, and it will pay off in spades as they get older. Okay, now, this is easy, but sometimes when kids aren't used to this, it can be a little tricky. So my next piece of this is you got to hold your ground, right? Um, and sometimes kids will push back. And what I've learned is you just, the answer is the same. And this is, a, this is a piece I learned from my time with horses and animals, right? If I set up a situation and I, I'm trying to help the horse find the answer, the horse is going to try the wrong answer first, right? So like I'm, I have a horse at home right now. I'm helping him learn to back up a little more smoothly. And so I, I hold my hands and I just set my hands and I wait. And so his first answer is like, head up here. I'm like, no. So I just hold my hands the same way. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to go this way. I'm like, no. I don't get after him. I don't yell at him. I don't kick him. I just hold my hands the same way. And he's like, okay, now I'm going to try going like this. <laughs> and I'm like, nope, the answer is still the same. And I hold the pressure. And then eventually he stumbles across and he's like, okay, I'm going to try this now. And I'm like, correct. And I release the pressure, right? So with your kids, if you're getting a little pushback, gently hold the pressure until they find the right answer, right? The right answer is, you are capable and smart enough to find something to do to occupy yourself for this period of time. I'm here, you're safe, I'm not abandoning you, I'm not locking the door and kicking you out on the front porch, but you can go entertain yourself. And so I find that sometimes this is just a transition period and it's okay to go through it. This is possibly very unscientific, but this is how I think of it. I, 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 have you guys ever heard the term like cheap dopamine? Have ever talked about that? I don't know if there's actually cheap dopamine and not cheap dopamine. I think that's kind of something we make up. I think dopamine is just a chemical in the brain that's the same regardless. But what I, what I see happening, even in myself, is that with our modern world, we have a lot of access to this cheap dopamine. It's easy access, right? Your smartphones, your kid's iPad, is designed to reward the brain every time they swipe, click, tap, 
win the game, whatever, right? And it's bam, bam, bam. It's instant gratification. Fighting that is like fighting your biology. It's almost impossible. Even for adults, y'all, even for me, I know better, I've seen the research. I still seek the dopamine of my phone sometimes. We all do it. If we've been exposed to screens, we all do it. It is powerful. So it takes some time to get our brains hooked on what I call, again, non-scientific, the slow dopamine. You also get dopamine from planting your garden. You get dopamine from looking at the sourdough bread you made and going, wow, it turned out so good. Or look what I did. I got the starter going. Or I've been putting off doing this thing on the homestead and I did it and now I feel so good. That's the slower quality dopamine. And when you're only used to the cheap stuff from the slot machine of your phone, it takes a while to transition for both you and your kids. So let them go through that transition period. Don't change your, your ask. Just like the horse, you hold your hands and you wait. Hold your hands and you wait. Don't change it. Don't react. Don't freak out. Don't kick them harder, the horse or the kids. Just hold the hands in the same place and wait, right? Okay, and then my last little trick for this is doing what I call inoculating the situation. So I'm not going to go entertain the children all the time, and I'm not going to play for them. I see a lot of moms, they're like, man, I'm so exhausted all the time because I have to play with Johnny all day long. And I'm like, it's great to play with your kids. That's fantastic. And I spend a lot of time with my kids, but you're not expected as an adult to play with your kids 24-7, right? I think that's a modern expectation that is unrealistic and also exhausting. So what I will do, though, if my kids are struggling to latch on to the next thing, is I will inoculate. I'll say, you know, I think I heard some uh, bullfrogs in that little pond slash puddle last night. Or would you like me to get down the box of Legos for you? I'm not going to play Legos with them at that moment, maybe later, but I'll get it down. Or um, here's some ingredients for homemade Play-Doh. Do this when they're older, not when they're tiny. Here's, here's some ingredients for homemade Play-Doh. I'll help you find a recipe for it. And then I walk away, right? So inoculate, give them ideas, but don't do it for them because you'll rob them of the good stuff. All right. So encourage curiosity above all else in yourselves and your kids. Next pillar of raising old-fashioned kids is cultivate capability. So this spring, uh, I think it was March, we were calving. Some of you know we have our homestead cows that are personal stuff, and then we have a bigger group of Herefords that we lease pasture for at our neighbor's place down the road, and then we use those for our beef operation. We ship beef all over the U.S. So calving is somewhat stressful. I know we have some cattle folks here. It's just, it just takes a lot of your time. It takes a lot of your energy. We try to stay out of the way as much as possible, but sometimes you got to get in the way to intervene and save the life of the cow or the calf. And so... Uh, it had been a long day. It was 8 o'clock that night, definitely dark and cold, and we get a call from our neighbor who was on, on duty that night to watch the cows, and he called my husband, and he's like, one of your heifers, I think you're going to have to pull the calf. Okay, It's not unnormal, or not abnormal. We, we have that happen every once in a while. So my husband you know, puts on his work clothes, all his coats, all the stuff, and he starts to head out the door, and my 10-year-old son is like, can I go with him? You know, initially... It's a school night. We're homeschool, but it's still a school night, and it's been a long day. And you know that mom in you just wants to be like, can you just go to bed and we'll just keep things simple, right? Just keep things simple. But I figured they'd only be down there for a half an hour, 45 minutes. I'm like, they'll be fine. He can go. Well, 8.30 rolls around, 8.45, 9 o'clock, 9.15, 9.30. I get a phone call. I'm like, this is a bad sign. Uh, th there's no pulling this calf. It's upside down, backwards, all the things. We have to take it to the vet to do a C-section. We don't do a lot of C-sections, but when you do, it's like a whole ordeal. So he's like, it's 9.30, I'm going to drive home, hook up the trailer, drive back to the neighbor, load the cow, drive to the vet, which is 30 minutes away, do, do, do the C-section, and then we'll have to go do the whole thing in reverse to get home. So I'm on my way to bed, um, and I have my other two kids at home with me, and my son gets on the phone, can I go with him? Right? And I'm like, oh, I just want it to be easy tonight, I just want you to not be grumpy for school in the morning. And I'm also in the back of my mind thinking, he's never seen a C-section. He's seen us pull calves, which is all the things that birth would be, but C-sections on an animal are a whole nother thing. Like, it's, it is like guerrilla warfare. Like, you're in there, you're cutting through a lot of tissue, it's a big cut. The vet, often if it's a big calf, like, she'll be in there with her elbows. Like, it's a full body procedure for multiple people, and there's lots of fluid and lots of blood. Sometimes the, the calves are dead, sometimes the cow dies in the shoe. Like, it doesn't always end that way, but it can be 
pretty gruesome. And so I'm going, I don't know if he, is he ready for that? <laughs> so against my better judgment, I give in. I'm like, I guess, I guess you can go, buddy. And I'm thinking, I wonder what aftermath I'll have to deal with tomorrow. So uh, since I am a, a selfish woman, I went to bed and I didn't wait for my husband to get home. And so I had no idea what happened that night, but turns out I woke up the next morning and they were home. They gotten home at 2 a.m. And I, my, my son's still in bed, and I'm kind of like wondering how he's going to be this morning. We're going to have to talk through some, some of the trauma of the, the night. So he comes out of his room. He's got big bags under his eyes. It looks horrible. And he's like, Mom, that was the best night ever. <laughs> and turns out, um, not only did he get to watch the C-section and ask a million questions, like every homeschool mom's dream, right? The vet was happy to oblige. Um, as she was sewing the cow back up, they both survived the cow and the calf. She's like, she, I mean, they don't know us super well. So she handed my son a bottle because the cow was still had her tail blocked. She's still under anesthesia. And she's like, why don't you milk her out and, and give the baby his first meal? Not thinking he'd do it. She was just trying to appease him. So he kind of knew that no one thought he was capable. So he went around the cow and milked an entire bottle of milk and was over there nur or feeding the calf before anybody knew what was happening. And that just boosted his little confidence to death. She even sent him home with a piece of dissolvable suture, which is still in a bowl of water, on my counter to see how long it takes to dissolve. Home, you know, homeschool science experiment. So he literally had the night of his life. He still talks about it, not only because he got to play a role in a very important real life situation that was just a little bit out of his comfort zone, but there was also something at stake. Right? There was something real happening. And, and what I found with kids, and adults too, that they are so much more capable than you think. So much more capable than you think. And I think this is another um, symptom of our modern era where we have this tendency to put our kids in kid boxes all the time. Have you guys ever noticed that? There's kid spaces and kid menus and kid this and kid that. And I'm not saying that's bad all the time. There's definitely topics and subjects matter that kids shouldn't be exposed to. So I'm not saying that's all bad. But I feel like sometimes we're compartmentalizing them out of the real world. And we're compartmentalizing them out of really amazing opportunities. And so what I have found time and time again is they're more capable than you think. And it was interesting to see in, that, in the comments of that video, uh, the viral video, one of the things that came up a lot, because I showed my kids, they were stitching some leather and they were helping would do some homestead chores and they were cooking. The people kept saying, that's not real. That, kids don't do that. You made that up. You staged that for the camera. And I'm like, what a sad world we live in that a kid cooking a pancake feels so unattainable. That's not real, y'all. That is not the real world. Kids can cook pancakes. Kids can milk a cow. Kids can help with the chores. And it's not child labor, although sometimes I do joke about that. My kids are used to me joking about that. It's not bad child labor. It is confidence building magic to give them those real world responsibilities. And when we do, they expand and grow beyond our wildest dreams. And so what I like to think of this as is this, we call, I call it the competence cycle. And this also, works with adults. Uh, another way to think of this, I call it the hook them on the dopamine cycle, right? Um, so think about when you try a new homestead skill. So name something you guys did in the last, somebody, what did you do in the last week that felt really good? It was an accomplishment. Shout it out. Butcher chickens. I mean, were you nervous going into it? Okay, so you did more chickens than last year. So there was that little bit of tension, like, what's this going to be like? Can we get it done in the same amount of time? What, how's it going to work, right? But how did you feel when you were done? Freaking awesome. Yeah, and exhausted, but good exhausted, right? And so, I don't know about you, but when I have that tension of, can I do this thing? Am I capable of this? And I push through that tension, that fear, and I do it. And maybe the outcome isn't completely perfect, right? There's always something when I accomplish. I'm like, that was good, but I could have done this better for next time. That's fine. But man, it feels so good on the other side. You realize that you are more capable than you thought. And what do you want to do? You want to do it again. It's the same with our kids. And so what we have to be careful to do as parents, I know a lot of you are already really good at this. I'm kind of preaching to the choir on this one. But 
give them a chance to, to work through that tension so they get that competence on the other side. And what will happen, especially if you have kids who are tentative to, to do this, they're not quite, eh, I don't know if I want to do the homestead thing, I'm not quite sure I want to help with the chicken chores, I'm not quite sure about this milk cow thing. If you can guide them through, if you can set up that situation and let them start, even if they do it in a bumbling way, right, maybe not exactly how you would do it, you don't have to keep motivating them because life will motivate them. They'll get that competence, confidence cycle going, and then you won't be able to stop them. And when that happens, it is one of the best feelings as a parent. And it can happen in little ways, and it can happen in big ways, but this is, I believe, how we build adults that are resilient and that can move through the world around them in a confident way. I love this quote by Lenore Skenazi. She wrote the book Free Range Kids. She's kind of the pioneer of some of these ideas. Uh, I think she was one of the ones who had the cops called on her when her kid rode their bike to the park or something. Like, she is gritty, and she is not afraid to put herself out there. But she is a huge advocate of allowing our kids to live and operate in the real world, right? Um, her quote, you don't remember the times your dad held the handlebars. You remember the times he let go. I know that is so true in my own life. Um, so many, in so many areas, I remember very vividly the first time I learned how to drive a tractor. And it was with my 4-H leader's husband, never driven anything before. I was super nervous. I wasn't a competent driver of anything. I think I was 14. And there was this clutch, and there was these things, and I was in this hay field, and there was rows, and he's like, he jumped up on the, the side, and he's like, okay, here's how you do this, and here's how you steer, and here's how you do the clutch, and rake it like this. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I turn around to ask him a question, and he was gone. He'd driven away, right? And I am, there's no cell phones. So I'm out here in this pasture, the long walk to the house. So it was do or die. So I figured it out, right? I popped the clutch a few times. My rows were a little bit wavy. But a couple hours later, I was raking like a pro. All the anxiety and adrenaline had left. And I felt so amazing. But if he had stayed on that tractor and micromanaged me for two hours, I, it wouldn't have been the same result, right? And maybe the, the end would have been the same. Maybe my rows would have been a little bit straighter. We might have had some hay to bale at the end. But it wouldn't have, I wouldn't be telling you that story today. I probably wouldn't have even remembered it, right? And so it was that risk that he took of leaving a kind of incompetent 14-year-old girl on his tractor in his hay field. He took that risk. But him doing that was a, was a memorable point in my life that built my confidence. And so I'm always thinking how can I do that same thing for my kids? So a few practical examples for you. Let them be a part of the team. Also, I realize in this picture, it looks like the log is going to fall on my two-year-old's head. It's really just perspective. I promise that wasn't going to actually happen. I believe in risky play, but not, not quite that risky, right? We, we avoid concussions when possible. Um, so, but this is my daughter. She's now seven. She's not that little anymore. But one thing that we've done right from the beginning, and, I, and I'm thankful for this advice that my, my grandfather actually gave it to my mother before I was born. And he said, don't change your world to fit the child. Let the child come into your world. And my mom imparted that to me. And it stuck enough that I, I started to think about that when my own children were small. And it's not that we, you know, we don't do things for our kids or we, or we don't have kid-centered activities. We do all those things, right? My, I have kids in basketball and kids in 4-H. And I will spend an entire week of my summer at the fair. Name fair parents here. Yeah, it's like, you know fair. It's like you live at the fair. It's all you do. So we have plenty of times in our life when we're doing our, our kids and we're helping our kids chase their passions. But, man, it has been powerful bringing them along with us. And, and one of the things I did, even when my children were infants, if you guys, if there's anyone with little babies here, this, they don't have to be excluded, right? I would take those newborns out in the barn with me. They melt with me. I would, there's more than once I've nursed on a bucket sitting in the middle of the barn. I would put a playpen in... Um, our barn on the really hot days because the barn had a breezeway and it would blow. It would be kind of cooler than our house. And I put the, I had, a, had to do a fly net to keep the flies off the baby. And I'd put them in there and I'd do chores. And it helped my mental health as a new mom because sometimes being stuck in the house with a newborn all the time is hard. And it also helped my kid. Well, they slept better in the cool air, but they also learned that, hey, if mom walks into that stall, she's not leaving me. She's coming back. And she's not far, but I can sit here and I'll be okay. So it can start really young. And it teaches the kid that 
the world doesn't revolve around you, but you are a really important part of our team. And we want you here, and we want you to be a part of our team because you are valuable. Your skills matter, and we like having you around. And that's a really good perspective for adults and kids to have. I think a lot of, I see a lot of young adults in our circles that need that lesson, even as 20 year olds, 25 year olds, right? They haven't learned that young, so it's not too late. Um, I think the hardest part of this for me in the past and continuing is to let your kids mess up. Does anyone else struggle with that or is that just me? It is hard and I know better, but I still have to constantly talk myself through that, right? It's a it's an admirable trait. We want to pave the road for our children. We also don't want them to mess things up in our kitchen or our gardens, right? We want to make things easier for them and us. But sometimes when we jump in to fix all the problems for them ahead of time, we not only rob them of that confidence, competence cycle, but we also kind of hurt their confidence. And I saw myself doing this with my daughter a lot as she was learning to cook. And it was so hard for me. Um, I know the kitchen. I know my kitchen. I know these recipes inside and out. I know all the little things that you have to do to make sure they turn out, right? Just those things, I call it feel. The feel you develop with the biscuits. You can read the recipe, but the recipe never can tell you the feel until you just do it. And so what I would find myself doing is my daughter was learning to cook. I would have the recipe and I'd be like, okay, you, you go do that. I'm going to be over here. I'm over here. You just, you just do that. And then I'd be like, no, no. If, if you pat it just this little way different, it looks better. And I'd be like, okay, I'm over, I'm over here now. You just, you just do that. Okay, did you turn on the oven? You need to have it really, really hot for these extra hot, not what the recipe says. And she, and then like, you know what I did? I was trying to be so helpful. I killed her motivation to cook for a period of time. She didn't want to do it anymore, right? How fun is it to have mom micromanaging you? Not, not fun at all. And so as hard as it was, I started walking away, right? I gave her the, she knows how to turn on the gas stove. She knows where the bowls are. She knows where the flowers are. The flower is, and I walked away. And the first few batches of biscuits weren't great, right? They were flat. They were burned. She doughy, all the things. I didn't say anything. I'm like, cool, good job. You did the biscuits. Good job. And then that confidence, competence cycle started to kick in. And now she's cooking all the time. And she doesn't need me. And now her biscuits look better than mine. The other day, I needed uh, some biscuits for a, a video I was making. Mine turned out horrible. She's like, mom, let me do that. She made the, the, the biscuits that ended up being on the video, right? Prettier than my biscuits. But it wasn't because I was telling her I had to walk away. And so it's hard, guys. It's hard as a parent. But sometimes those failures, sometimes letting them figure it out on their own, is the absolute best thing we can do with them. So do for them, for adults and kids. I also um, apply this when I'm training new staff in my restaurant, right? I, I was helping a girl make green chili the other day. She's not super handy in the kitchen. And so it was everything I could do to, like, oh my gosh, you're going to burn all of that. You're, it's like a restaurant-sized pot, right? You could boil a small child in this pot. It's huge. And I'm like, oh, so they're, oh. And so, but I, I remembered, okay, remember your lesson, Jill, remember. So I walked away. And I, I'd stay, little bits of advice here and there, but I stayed away enough. And she was beaming by the time she got done making that green chili. She'd never been green chili in her life. But I had to let her do it. I had to let her work through it and think through it. I had to set up the situation and let her find it. That's a principle I learned with the horses that it has applied to everything in my life. Set up the situation, let them find it. Don't force them, you cannot force them. Well, you can, but you'll be grouchy and they'll be grouchy at the end. Let them find it. So as we close today, we covered some, some ground. Right? We covered a couple different concepts. We talked about curiosity. We talked about the magic of boredom and the shower principle. Um, I hope you go home and try that. I hope you, you start to take note of when those ideas come. I think it's, it's really fun to start to, to put those pieces together. You've learned that kids are more capable than we think. You've learned about that magic, confidence, competence cycle. So next steps after we leave here today well, first off, you can come find me at my booth and we'll take a picture and I'll sign a book plate for you. If you would like my book, which has the rest of this information that we couldn't cover today because there's just not enough time to get to all the good things, um, I have something special that we put together just for the conference goers, the festival goers today. So the book does not exist yet. It's called Old Fashioned on Purpose, but you can pre-order it from your favorite retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Hopefully you have a local bookstore. You can get it from your local bookstore. And when you pre-order, you get all of those bonuses. And I won't go through them all for sake of time. Take a picture. Um, 
And then if you come, this is the special part for the conference, folks, come to my table by the milk cow, and I will sign you a book plate sticker. You keep it, and then when the book comes to your house in September, I will, uh, you'll, you'll have the sticker to put in the book, right? So I can't sign the book because they don't exist, but I can sign the sticker and you can stick it in. So it's the next best thing. So check it out. The, the bonuses are pretty sweet. We put them together just for pre-order folks. Once the book is actually available, these bonuses will go away. So oldfashionedbook.com. One last story for y'all. So I talked about blizzards yesterday in my talk. Some of you heard that. Um, has anyone ever, though, experienced a ground blizzard? They're different, yes. They're a little different than a regular blizzard. So um, it was last year, I believe. We had had a big snowstorm, and then the next day it was super sunny and, and calm, right? That's what, that's what it does in Wyoming quite a bit. It's our pattern. So the roads were clearing, and it's about 45 minutes to town, and I wanted to do some errands and get some groceries done, and that was my one afternoon I could do it. So I... My, my husband was checking our cows, we were calving, and my kids were at home, and everything was good at home, so I decided to head to town for the afternoon. On my way there, the roads were fantastic. But while I was running my errands, all the, 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 the wind picked up, and we started to experience a ground blizzard. And if you've never experienced it, it's so hard to explain, because it's, it's like Little House on the Prairie level, like you can't see the barn from the house. Like what, those stories about them tying the rope, from building to building, that is not made up. That is absolutely true. This picture is not even a real blizzard. This is just moving snow, but I couldn't even show you a picture of a ground blizzard because it would just be white. Uh, there have been times standing in this place, I couldn't see the fence, the H braces of the fence. Like it is a full on whiteout because there's no storm in the sky, but the wind picks up and blows thousands of miles of snow across the prairie with nothing to stop it. And it is intense. So when that happens, they shut down the roads like that because the snow plows physically can't keep up, physically cannot keep up. Like the underpasses will fill full and the visibility is horrendous. There have been times where I have driven by my exit and I have not known, I mean, I've literally, the exit I've gone for 15 years and I couldn't see it in this, this blizzard. So they shut the roads while I was in town because this blizzard had picked up. So I, there I was, I hadn't brought any extra clothes and I certainly was not in the mood to go hang out in town for the evening, like I had things to do at home, y'all. And so I was rather annoyed and you know, I'm calling my husband and I'm like, I don't wanna be stuck in town, I don't know what to do, it could be 24 hours till they open the roads. Not to mention, he was at our neighbors checking cattle and they're not far from us, but they're far enough that once it starts blowing, he often gets snowed in there. And my kids were home alone with the wood stove, with a goat that was on the verge of kidding. And I, you know, my husband had spotty cell service. I was stuck 45 minutes away and my, I could feel that, that panic starting to rise, right? I hadn't left them with any food. Uh, I didn't know if we had firewood in the, in the firebox. So it was just mass chaos. And so making all these phone calls, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. A couple hours later, I decide that I'm going to uh, squeeze home on some of these back roads. Now, very important, if you come visit us in the winter in Wyoming, never do that, right? Because you think you can make the back roads, but often they're not as clear as you might see on um, Google Earth, okay? So I had a lead on some back roads that felt pretty good and I knew that I could make it and if it was really bad, I, I would know enough to turn around. So a little sketchy, but I decided I was gonna give it a try. I was calling my daughter and she's like, yeah, we're okay for now, just, you know, I don't know what we'll do, it's, it's fine, it's fine. So make it home, it takes me an hour and a half for the 45 minute drive. Thankfully, I met, one, this is a small town, y'all, I met our friend who's a snowplow driver randomly on one of the exits and he like went ahead of me a little ways. Um, I finally make it home. My heart is pounding. I have like, I'm coming off all the adrenaline of driving and worrying and visibility. And I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna walk into when I get into the house. I'm hoping my kids aren't too stressed out. I hope that the goat hadn't kidded. I, I just like, just full on, just frazzled. So I open the door, kind of bracing for the worst. My husband is still not home from calving. My kids are standing there with the biggest Cheshire cat grins on their face. They're all lined up like this. And they step back. There are fresh biscuits and gravy on the table. There is a full box of wood. The fire is roaring. And I get a report that the goat is progressing nicely, but there are no babies yet. And I realized that me being physically incapable 
of meddling in that day, not that it would have been bad, but me being absent gave them a chance to rise up and shine. And what I was afraid as a mom, oh my gosh, trauma for my kid, I hope they're okay, I hope they don't feel abandoned, they saw as an adventure. And they were thinking this was the most exciting day ever because there was something at stake, just enough risk, not, you know, I wasn't thinking the house is going to burn down, but it was just enough risk that they had to rise up and that confidence, competence cycle kicked in and they felt so darn good about themselves. So as we close today, I just want to reassure you, you don't need acreage, you don't need a wood stove, you don't need a stock trailer, you don't need ground blizzards in order to raise well-adjusted, competent kids. You can do this wherever you are right now. It's about the principles more than the exact pieces, right? And even if you're in an apartment, even if you're in a suburban homestead situation, there are so many ways that you can set this up and let them find it. And in this world of ours that places so many crazy expectations on us as parents, they expect us to do all the things and be all the things all the time, I hope it's reassuring to you as much it is, as it is to me that old-fashioned parenting removes a lot of this burden, y'all. We can strategically do less and we'll all be better as a result. When we allow our kids time to play, there's less pressure on us to entertain them and they start to move their bodies and develop all those life skills. When we foster competence, they become more capable and our families run more smoothly overall. And every single time I lean into these ideas, I end up with happier, more competent kids. So my friend, parents here today, I want you to pat yourself on the back. You're doing a good job. Turn them loose, let them mess up, let them eat a little dirt, and know that you're doing the right thing. So thanks for being here with me today.